Mary was engaged to Joseph. She found herself pregnant before being married. An angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and assured him that Mary's pregnancy is holy, divine. God's Holy Spirit has given her a child. Watch for this. A virgin will be pregnant and bear a son. They will name him Emmanuel, God with us. All right, all right. Hey, it's good to be with you guys. I'm Jake. I pastor here alongside my beautiful wife who was just up here. Uh, I really like her a lot. Um, I love this Sunday. I think Gift to the World Sunday is probably one of the things I look forward to the most for the same reason that she was saying. It's just so cool to see us being able to live out that call, right? The love God, love people, serve the world. We are serving the world. We're bringing the gospel message to the corners of the earth because these, these people that we're partnered with, Worldcast Ministries and the Water Project, it's not just, it's not just about clean water or it's not just about, you know, bringing children out of slavery. It's about the gospel message to these places. And I love that. And so, so thankful for you guys who are willing to participate in that. We are going into week two of our series called The Royal Risk. This series, the whole heart behind it is that we're trying to connect uh, both what came as we come near to this Christmas time, the coming of the perfect Jesus, and then the, the, the lineage, this, this incredible line of people that were so imperfect that led to this moment. And so we are going back and we're looking through some of the stories that we find uh, in Matthew 1, Matthew, the tax collector, who is one of the 12 disciples, uh, he opened up his telling of the good news, his, his gospel, by quoting a genealogy. And we read about it last week, and it was awesome. And I'm just going to tell you guys right now, I sang really hard during worship this morning, which I, yeah, and I might lose my voice. So if that happens, bear with me. It's cool. All the cool people have raspy voices. Okay, um, but they, he opened up this genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew because uh, what Matthew was, who he was writing to were Jews. His audience were the Jews who were expecting a Messiah. And so he opens up his Gospel with this genealogy so that they can see that Jesus, this claimed Messiah, came from the line of Abraham and the line of Judah and the line of King David, who was who were the people that the Messiah was supposed to come from. That was the line he was supposed to come from. So it was important for him to be able to communicate this to the Jews. Last week we opened up and I read through that genealogy that's found in Matthew 1. Uh, I'm not going to read it again. Uh, as much as I know some of you were impressed with my pronunciation of all those fun names, uh, I will say I don't know if I said any of them correctly, but I said them confidently, uh, and that was enough for most of you guys, so that's good. But one of the things that is so unique about Matthew's genealogy is that there are five women who are mentioned in that genealogy. And it is rare for genealogies to carry the names of women in them. You rarely ever see it. But in Matthew's genealogy, you see Tamar, and you see Rahab, and, and Ruth, and Bathsheba, who is Uriah's wife, and you see Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it's so unique that they are in there, but it's even cooler because their stories are, are so incredible as you recognize how they lead to Jesus. Last week we talked briefly about Tamar and we talked more in depth about Rahab, uh, but today we're going to be looking at the story of Ruth. And so uh, we're going to start in chapter 4 of the book of Ruth in our Old Testament. It actually uh, has a genealogy in it. So I am going to read a genealogy this week, but it's a lot shorter than last week, so you can stay with me. This is what it says, starting in verse 18. It says, This then is the family line of Perez. Perez the fa was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Solomon, Solomon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. Now, this genealogy is almost verbatim. That section is almost verbatim to what we see in the genealogy that is found in Matthew 1. The only difference is there's no Tamar, there's no Rahab, there's no Ruth. Remember, women were rarely ever mentioned in genealogies. And you see this even in this book of Ruth. And yet this is their line, right? Perez, that first name there was the son of Tamar and Judah. A few generations after that, we see Solomon who marries this prostitute from Jericho named Rahab, who's, who, who by her faith was brought into this Israelite fold. And then their son... So the son of Rahab and the son of, of Solomon was Boaz, who plays a pivotal role in the story that we're going to tell today uh, that is about this woman, Ruth. And it's found in this little book in the Old Testament. It's entitled Ruth, and so we're going to be there today. 
this book really is a beautiful story. And ultimately, it ends with this genealogy that we just read because it's a historical book that is meant to, to build a bridge, to, to connect between the time that the Israelites were led by the kings, which you see with King Saul and King David, uh, and then the time that they were led by the judges. And so this was this little time period in between these two times. Uh, and it's really cool because this historical book is meant to show the ancestry of David. King David, who is known to be the greatest king of all time, this is his genealogy, and it's meant to tell that story. But even though this book is history, it's also incredibly practical. And it beautifully foreshadows who the person of Jesus is, who ultimately is the end of this lineage that we are talking about. So we're going to be in Ruth 1 today. You can follow along with me as we go. It says this. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the, the names of his two sons were Melon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab to live there. Now, I'm not going to read every single verse in these four chapters in the, in the book of Ruth, um, but I do want to tell the story. Because what we see here is this Jewish family, these descendants of Judah, who leave Israel during a time of famine to go to the land of Moab, who historically is actually an enemy of Israel. So they go and live among the Moabites. And Elimelech and Naomi's sons, Malon and Kilian, they marry these, these Moabite women, these non-Jewish Gentile pagan women, just like Rahab was, non-Jewish Gentile pagan and they come to this land, and they're living here in Moab, and then Elimelech dies, all right? So the father of this family dies, and then not too long after that, the two sons die, Malon and Kilian. So the three men of this family die, so Naomi, this Jewish widow, is in the land of Moab with her two daughters-in-law, not knowing what to do. And so she hears back from Israel that, that the, the time of the famine is over, that, that has passed, that the land is fruitful again. And so she decides, well, there's nothing for me here in Moab, so why stay here? Why stay here when I don't have family here? I just have my daughters-in-law, who I love, but like they have their own families. And so she, she communicates with these daughters-in-law and says, you guys, go back to your families. Go back to your homes. Like, there's nothing for you. I'm going to go back to Israel. There's nothing for you there. I'm old. I'm probably not going to have any more kids. So it's like, I'm not going to produce another son that you can marry. And even if I did get pregnant and have a son, like, are you really going to wait around until he's of age to marry him? Like, it just doesn't make sense. So go back to your families. Uh, enjoy your life. Find a new husband, whatever it may be. I'm going to go back to Israel. And so these two daughters-in-law, the, the story says that they have this incredibly... Um, like, they, they cry together, they, they embrace each other, and, and one of the daughters-in-law, Orpah, not Oprah, but Orpah, uh, she decides to stay, and they, they cry, and she leaves back to her family, but this other woman named Ruth just clings to her mother-in-law, and they're crying together, and, and, and Naomi says, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Go back with her. But Ruth replies, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, even if death separates you and me. So Ruth is committed. She is loyal to her mother-in-law. And Naomi tries to persuade her to stay, but realizes that Ruth is with her. That they're going to do this thing together. And so Ruth and Naomi, they head back into Israel. In the end of chapter 1, it says that uh, when they got back to Israel, it was the beginning of the barley harvest. And so things got hard for Naomi and Ruth because now they are these two widows who are living in Israel together. There's no one to take care of them. So they are hungry. They, they, this is a hard time. And so Ruth comes up with this idea, I'm going to go out to the fields and I'm just going to follow behind the harvesters. I'll just follow behind them and I'll start collecting little things that they miss, little pieces of food, some grain that they miss so that way we have something to eat. So she's literally scavenging for food, trying to find anything. And that is when this son of a Jerichoan prostitute, son of Rahab, comes into the picture. It says, as it turned out, she was working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So Elimelech was Naomi's husband. So he is a relative. He's family. 
Just then Boaz arrived from, Baru- from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters, the Lord be with you. And they responded, the Lord bless you. And I just, first of all, I just love that. Boaz, as you'll see throughout the story, is a great godly man, but like he's a, he, he's a boss, right? He, he has people that serve underneath him. And I love just to see how he responds, right? I think for me, who, who I have people that work underneath me, and, and I know many of you have people that are employees of you, like, you should take note from what Boaz does. Like, how he treats his people is pretty incredible. And what I love even more about that as you read into the story of how great Boaz is and how godly he is, is that he is the son of this Jericho and prostitute. And it's a beautiful picture that when Rahab turned from her wicked ways, from, from the, the pagan nation that she was part of and started following the God of Israel, when she put her faith in that God, that it actually transformed the generations to follow her. And that her son is this incredibly godly man. And so I think for us, you know, as we recognize, I'm I'm, I'm one of those people who had parents who broke generational curses and decided to follow Jesus instead of follow the ways of the world. And I get to reap the blessing of that. And so for all of us, where, where we're at in our stories, recognize that as you follow Jesus, you're actually going to change the lives of those who come after you, which is pretty cool. It's a side note. It doesn't actually go with where we're going, but still good. Um... So back to the story. Boaz comes out to his field. He then sees Ruth picking up these grains, following the harvesters. And he says, who does that young woman belong to? He knows who his harvesters are. He's seen them. He's like, okay, I know this family and that family and those people. But who's that? What is she doing here? Who is she? And so one of his overseers explains who she is, that she is the daughter-in-law of Naomi, uh, the widow of Naomi's son. She's been working all day really hard collecting these grains. Um, And so Boaz goes up to her and he says, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here saying, stay here. This is your spot. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the woman. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and drink from the water jars the men have filled. And Ruth is just floored by his kindness. She's like, what is this? Like, why are you treating me like this? I'm a foreigner. Like, I'm a Gentile. I'm not Jewish. And he says, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and mother and your homeland and you came to live with the people you did not know before. He could have said, just like my mom, right? Because his mom left her people and came to live with the people who she did not know before. Because he's like, I'm only half Jewish. He says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And from there, you get to see how good and how godly Boaz is as he, and how generous he is as he takes care of this woman. He pretty much brought her into the fold of his community, and he gave her all the same rights as all the other people that worked for him. And he gave her extra grain and gave her all this extra food to the point that when, when she went home, when she went back to Naomi, she had this plethora of food, and Naomi was like, what? Like, where did you get all that from? Like, what field did you go to? Like, this is crazy. Like, how did you get all this food? She said, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And so Ruth tells her, well, I found my way into Boaz's field, and I, I worked there, and I followed his laborers, and he took care of me, and, he, and he, he gave me all this food. He let me work alongside all of them. And Naomi says, man, the Lord bless him. The Lord bless him. She says, he has not stopped showing his kindness to living and the dead, meaning he has shown kindness to us, but also our husbands who have passed away by taking care of us. She also adds, you know, that man is actually one of our relatives. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Now, guardian redeemer is probably not a phrase that you are really familiar with. Other translations call it a kinsman redeemer. Uh, It's something that is we don't see in our culture today, but was incredibly prevalent in the Jewish culture. And it was actually written into their laws to protect widows like Ruth and like Naomi. It was meant to protect their land. It was meant to protect their family lineage of the men who had passed. You can read about it in Leviticus 25. But the guardian redeemer was this, this, the closest blood relative that was meant to, to take the widow to be his wife so that her land would be protected of the family and also that that line would be continued. Um, And because we know the family line that goes from here, that Jesus comes from this family line, that King David comes from this family line, this is probably one of the more important guardian redeeming stories that we see. 
So in this story, we see Ruth. She goes and she does the, the, the cultural presentation of herself to Boaz as he is sleeping. She goes and lays herself down at his feet. Uh, when he wakes up, she explains to him, like, hey, you are actually our family's guardian redeemer. And you can probably imagine that not everyone who is called out as a guardian redeemer is excited about the idea or even willing to accept the responsibility. But in this story, Boaz, he praises Ruth for her loyalty and says she's a woman of noble character. He gladly accepts the responsibility with just one caveat because there actually was another guardian redeemer who was a closer blood relative than he was. So he's like, we have to take care of that guy first for me to be able to do this and not like take care of him like hitman type status. Just, you know, go and talk to him and say, hey, do you want to be the guardian redeemer? And the guy initially, the other guy says, yeah, I, I, will, I will do that. And then he finds out that Ruth is this pagan Moabite woman. He goes, oh, no, 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 I don't want any part of that. And Boaz is probably like, yeah, no, she's the worst. You don't want to, <laughs> don't even get close to that. And inside he's like, yes, because he knows how great Ruth actually is and that she does love God and that she is this incredible woman. And so he's excited about it. And so the other guy says, no, Boaz, I was like, all right, I guess I'll be the guardian redeemer. Um, and so he goes and he buys the land of Elimelech and he, and he marries Ruth and they have this baby together. I don't know how that happened, but they, they did. And, and uh, they named him Obed, which is a really common name. Not anymore. I don't, any Obeds out there? No, I didn't think so. Um, but the line continues. This lineage continues. The line of David continues. The line of Jesus continues. And what was so cool about this story is Naomi is ecstatic right? Grandma is ecstatic. She's like, what is this? This is incredible. She's overjoyed. See, when Naomi and Ruth originally had come back to Israel, she actually told the people in Israel, hey, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because I am bitter, right? She just lost her husband. She just lost her two sons. She's like, I'm not Naomi. I'm Mara. I'm bitter. And yet in this story, the God of Israel has now blessed her with this grandchild, and she is overjoyed because she recognizes, because of her beautiful, kind, loyal daughter-in-law and this incredibly generous and loyal kinsman redeemer, guardian redeemer, she now gets to see the line of her family continue. Naomi's family has been redeemed. Like, this story is an incredible love story. We actually don't see stories like this throughout the rest of our Bibles. Like you don't see many love stories but in this one, you see it, and it's just beautiful. I mean, I feel like you could see a Hollywood movie based off of Boaz and Ruth. But truthfully, Ruth was the only one of the five women that we see in Matthew's genealogy. That story wasn't surrounded in scandal, right? Like Tamar tricked her father-in-law to sleep with her so that her family line could continue. Rahab was a prostitute from Jericho. Bathsheba was bathing on her roof when King David saw her and ended up committing adultery and murdering her husband. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus. Like, we, we know this story, but the optics tell a different story. Because this was a teenage girl who was a virgin uh, who was, being, who was um, engaged to be married, and she ends up being pregnant. What story does that tell? There's scandal wrapped around these other ones, but not with Ruth. This love story of a guardian redeemer and this immigrant woman is beautiful. And yet, it's just a shadow of the love story that actually came when Mary gave birth to that son and named him Jesus. See, Boaz redeemed the family of Ruth and Naomi, but Jesus came to redeem the entire world. In this book of Ruth, it actually beautifully illustrates God's work in that salvation because in the, in the story, how the story opens up, Ruth is an outsider. She's a stranger, but it ends with Ruth as a member of this covenant community because she married Boaz. Boaz paid the price for her redemption. He bought the land. He brought her into the fold. And our reality with Jesus is that we are all outsiders. We are all strangers. And yet Jesus came and paid the price for our redemption. But that price wasn't land. That price was the price of our sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. The wages of a sin is death. The cost of our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The price of our redemption for our guardian redeemer who is Jesus is death. Paul also wrote in his letter in Romans 5.8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ paid the price for us. See, if we're looking for a real love story, 
and a love story that, that directly affects us, we need to look to Jesus. John's gospel says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. To whoever believes, there is our redemption. Just like Paul says, Paul wrote, the gift of God is the eternal life in Christ Jesus. That is our lineage. For those of us who believe in Jesus, we have been redeemed by our guardian redeemer who is Jesus. And he has brought us into his family. And we get to live in eternity with him. That is the greatest love story. That is the story of our redemption. Jesus is our guardian redeemer. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I love that we get to look at these historical stories. And we get to see glimpses of a beauty that you fulfilled in how you lived. God, that you are our redeemer. That we had been left alone in need. And you came in and took that upon yourself to save us and to redeem us and to pay the price for us so that we could be brought into your family, that we could be brought into your salvation, that we can be brought into your eternity. We give this opportunity every week because it is the most important decision you can ever make in your life. But just like John's gospel says and just like Paul's letter to the Romans says, whoever believes in him that gift is eternal life. So if you've been living life on your own, you haven't given your life over to Jesus, you haven't believed in him, your redeemer, your guardian redeemer is at the door and is knocking. It's your decision to say yes, to walk into that freedom, to walk into that grace, walk into that eternity with our creator in heaven. So if you're here today, whether you're watching online or you're here in person with us, and you want to make that decision to follow Jesus today, all I want you to do is just raise your hand right where you're at and say, that's me. I need to say yes to Jesus. I see that hand right there. Praise you, God. Anyone else? See that hand back there? Praise you, Lord. If you're online, Max is on there with you. Pastor Max, you can just say, I, I'm making that decision, and we'll connect with you. But what we're going to do is we're going to pray this prayer together. We do this as a family because we have been brought into this family. We have been bought with the price, which was the death of Jesus on the cross. And so we are part of a family. We pray together, and you who have raised your hand, it's just the prayer that's saying, Jesus, I'm yours. I've been doing it on my own, and I'm sorry. I need to follow you. I'm giving my life to you. And so let's pray this prayer together. Repeat it after me. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I believe in you. You are my Savior. You are my Redeemer. You died for my sins. I surrender my life to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. God is good. Woo!